mentioned to get a cap to get here on time. I'd like to welcome you to the launch of a unique book called The River's Song. Tonight we're celebrating the launch of this book. And Su Chen, Su Chen is with us tonight to talk about the process and how she researched it and came to write this book. And Melissa de Villiers is here from the British Council as well. And uh, she will be interviewing Su Chen about the book. So this is a unique book, one that tells the history of Singapore's meteoric rise but not from the viewpoint of its politicians or its successful businessmen. This is a love story set against the true story of the removal of thousands of ordinary people from their makeshift homes around the river to new HDB flats out in the suburbs. The River's Song is the long-awaited fifth novel from distinguished author Su Chen and Christine Lin. She's already won the Singapore Literature Prize and the Southeast Asia Writer Award. But this new book, which is her first to be published in both the UK and America, shows a writer at the height of her abilities, handling language and emotions skillfully, inventing plot and characters which intrigue and captivate our attention from the opening page to the last. With no further ado, I'd like you to welcome Su Chen to read from us, for us from her new book, The Rose Song. If she knew it led to the French rose. 
she hand played the pipa for months. Hadn't had the heart to touch it. But to get up and leave now would be bad form. Professor Chi held up his hand and showed the audience his acrylic nails. In nine, and in music, we adapt to change. Yes. Ah, great big change, revolutionary change in China. In the old days, pipa players used fingernails like this. Today, we wear acrylic nails like these. Acrylic nails changed our play. Pipa strings also change from silk strings to gang xian or metallic strings. This changed the tonal colors of the pipa. Listen carefully. Can you hear the difference? He played a few notes on the pipa with metallic strings. Pin, set up, mesmerized with a new sound. It had been a long time since she last heard such beautiful notes from the pipa. Not since Uncle Chok Sook's death. Pipa began here as a brighter tonal palette. Listen again. Professor Chen played the pipa with silk strings. You hear it? What's the difference? The pipa with silk strings has more resonance. The words had popped up before she realized that she'd spoken. Yes, miss. Yes, yes, you in the front row. You said that. Please, please, come on stage. Come, come. You made a very good point. Come, come up, please. She felt the blood rushing to her face. She went up to the stage and he handed her his pipa. Ching, please, please play a few notes for us. And he spoke in Mandarin. Too short to refuse, she played the opening bar of a folk song. He recognized it at once and proceeded to play the same song on the other pipa with the metallic strings. His notes had such a clarity and purity of tone and pitch that she was devastated. Her opening bar was like a string of mismatched stones. His was a string of jade and pearls. Music come out of the silence in us. Speak the silence inside your heart and your music will flow. Please close your eyes and breathe in. Slowly, slowly, breathing in, breathing out. One, two, three, four, five. Listen to your breath. Listen with your inner ear. Breathing in, breathing out. He plucked a string on his pipa and gestured to her to do the same. She was dismayed and wanted to leave the stage. She didn't want to be humiliated again. He was putting her on shore, but his eyes held her and would not let her leave. He struck another tone, another note on his pipa, looked up at her and smiled. Play, he whispered. Don't fear. Please, sit down. He pointed to the chair beside him, determined not to let her leave the stage and wallow in self-pity after her miserable show. He played a few bars and looked at her expectantly, his eyes warm and friendly, winged from under his dark, bushy brows. Play, try, he said. You can do it, a woman in the front row smiled up at her. A few people clapped. Her resistance crumbling, 
she sat down with his people, held it upright on her lap, and composed herself. Uncle Chong so was dead. Wei was gone. What had she to fear if she played badly now? takes on the role of a storyteller and um, the <coughs> instrument actually um, mimics the sound of, um, and I'm going to do something very surprised here, uh, it mimics the sound of, for example, horses name <coughs> and we also sword fights, <coughs> drums and um, bells, horses, etc, etc. A whole entire gamut of uh, emotions and um, sounds. Hope you enjoy.
Thank you, Sam. That's a very, very difficult piece. It's the most difficult piece to play in the ancient repertoire of uh, pipa music. I think it's almost 2,000 years old. Yes. So thank you for the treat. Now I'm going to read you another section. Um, this time to introduce to you the first love of the heroine Pink, whom you met earlier on. Okay. His name is Wayne, and he is the um, senior or master flautist in the Singapore Chinese Orchestra. And this scene, he has just come out of prison where he was detained uh, for his part in the uh, protest against the eviction of the squatters, the boatmen, and uh, the hawkers along the Singapore River. Puck! The hard part slammed into his cheek. Are you a communist? No. Answer no, sir. No, sir. Are you working for the communists? You asked me that yesterday. The hard hand slammed his other cheek. What were you doing in the coffee shop all those nights? Don't try to lie. We have records of all meetings in the coffee shop. I was listening to people. Is it wrong to listen? The pencil case whacked his face, just missing his right eye. Dripping spit and blood. He wiped them off with the back of his hand. His throat hurt. A glass of water set on the table out of the reach of his parched mouth. The room was freezing cold. He was shivering on the block of ice in his underpants. The eyes of the man in a thick black woolen sweater stared hard at him. The implacable eyes grew larger and larger as the man pressed him for an answer. Suddenly the room was filled with eyes and mouths shouting, Liar, liar, liar! No, no, no! I'll wait, I'll wait. Wake up. It's all right, my son. It's all right. You're home. You're safe. Thank the Lord Buddha. You're safe at home. He opened his eyes, his ears, ringing as if there had been an explosion near his head. He felt his stepmother's hand on his chest, rubbing wicks on him felt the rising heat of the bar entering his body and allowed himself to savor the sensation of flesh on flesh. The palm of his stepmother's hand was rough, a washerwoman's hand that had slapped him and held him when he was a child. Her face, looking down at him, was anxious. It pained him to see crow's feet around her eyes. Her hair had grown white. He sat up. Will you eat something now? She asked. He started to eat the rice porridge she had brought while she sat on the chair next to him, her rough, wrinkled hands on her lap. These days, his stepmother was less loud less garrulous, less demanding. She made a great effort to accommodate his fluctuating moods. He turned to face the wall, ashamed of his sudden urge to cry. He cried so easily these days. It was as if he was trying to make up for all those dry months of stealing himself when he had to pit his heartness against the grey walls of his cell. And the men who interrogated him. He got out of bed, 
and went into the living room. The same television sat on the same low table as before, next to the same brown sofa and the low shelf for shoes. The furniture had not changed, yet the apartment felt strangely unfamiliar, as though he was a new tenant. A hush had settled in the flat. Kang and Lei had already left for work, and his stepmother was washing up at the kitchen sink. He walked through the tiny kitchen to use the bathroom and toilet. He showered three to four times a day now. The jets of cold water calmed him. He liked the privacy inside the bathroom, something denied him in the detention center. There, he had to strip, shower, and empty his bowels, all done with a guard watching him. He remembered the kind Malay guard who had averted his eyes when he was showering. But his partner, the young Chinese bloke, had stared stone-faced at his flaccid penis. I stopped it. Okay, <laughs> 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 <And> the rest. <laughs> I think he took to drink 
and eventually his wife called him a Chinese medium who came and uh, assumed the spirit, the monkey spirit, and he was whipped, I think. So when I read an interview long time ago, um, given by the senior servant who was given a medal by Lee Kuan Yew for cleaning up the river, I think the reporter asked him something like, um, did you and your team face problems? And I think he said, no, we didn't have any problems. And I thought, damn it, of course you have no problems. But all those other people who couldn't speak had problems. I, 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 I was just very moved by that man, you know, uh, because he, I think, sacrificed. I mean, while we, when we go to the river, you and I, we, have, we are the beneficiaries of, of this wonderful Clean River campaign. But I think of all the ten, more than 10,000 hawkers and, and, and farmers and, and sportsers who lost their homes. Uh, we seldom remember them these days. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, the novel brilliantly brings to mind that whole shadow across the people, you know, the sponsors, the hawkers, the people who took part in local protests about the eviction, who were sent to prison, people who don't quite fit into the shiny picture of the great Singapore success story, you could say. So, for me, as a reader, your novel sort of widens the framework of what constitutes our collective memory, you know, of the recent past. But reading it also made me wonder about what drives the writing of a novel like this. So when you come to write... Anger. Like, anger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anger. Also, did, did you sort of figure out the issues you wanted to cover? No. no. And then look for the characters to kind of No. No, no. It doesn't work that way for me. I know it works that way for some writers. But I think I had to... Um, uh, well, I, I, I did some research, you know, um, or why can't just be driven by anger and very partial. I wanted to know the other side of the story as well. So I did, um, I went to the archives, national archives. I went to listen to the recordings of all these uh, Teochew speaking uh, um, old men uh, who worked on the bum boats and all that. And, um, and as I said in an earlier interview, what I heard beneath the Teochew, which I couldn't understand completely, of course, I'm Cantonese. Uh, uh, I heard such suppressed sorrow, right? And, and um, also that, that made me think a lot more about the river because, uh, and here are the teachers around you. My teacher brought me when I was a teenager to explore the Singapore River. We trace it right up to the spring. This was at a time when I was a very young girl and all the rivers were not under the roads. All the rivers, you could see them, you know, and the swamp and the bamboos being built along the banks and we spoke to all these people, you know. So that school trip also played a part in my because I remember the colour, the, the, the warmth, you know, of, of all the Hokkien and Teochew speaking uh, uh, people along the route. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. But I'm interested because also one of the reasons the book works so well as a story for me was because it combines these issues of social upheaval that we've been talking about with an extraordinary love story. I mean, the relationship between Ping, who you, you read a bit about her, and Wen, the food player, her childhood protector and an and activist, shades from passion to separation and betrayal. But along the way, he also tackles on the darker areas of the human heart. And in what I think is quite singular in the whole body of recent Singaporean writing, the Slum Affair also tackles the notion of complicity. But the guilt we feel when we are just a bystander and others go to prison. So I wondered what spot. I think this is like my first full blown love story. I think as you get older, you get braver. <laughs> uh, uh, what I did when, when, when the uh, sample was playing, 
I, I had this um, image of somebody playing the pipa, and I felt it very difficult to reconcile between bamboo men squatters and pipa, you know, girl played pipa. So I just had to, I, I struggled with the whole tension of the, the contrast for about two years. And in the meantime, as I write, it was all that rubbish coming out while I was listening to pipa music, the kind that you were hearing. So it was all chaos inside my heart and listening to more. And then at the same time, I would sometimes listen to spring rain, autumn moon, you know, uh, yes, very soothing pipa music. And eventually, this, this story, this girl and her mother, the pipa queen of Chinatown, grew in my head. And I realized, I also did some research, of course, that around the area, Teluk Ayah Basin, those of you who are Singaporeans, Chinatown, you know, there used to be tea houses, you know, uh, that people would go and drink tea and listen to the pipa player, usually the women, you know, who were also part courtesan and uh, part pipa players. As Pink says in the novel about the river, you know, there's no telling what is done and what is harm. That's right. Yeah. Well, I also wondered, are you afraid to critique your society in this book at all? I mean, do you not have a duty to address political issues? Is that what drives you? Do you call yourself a dissident writer? Oh, no, 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 I'm not a dissident writer. I'm very obedient. I'm very obedient. I am a dragonfly. Uh, I just have be born with multiple eyes, you know. So if my teacher or the government says, look straight ahead, then I'm curious. I turn left, I turn right, I turn right, then I happen to see things. Yeah, yes. I know this <laughs> Excellent answer. Okay, well, that all your novels represent Singapore, this island of immigrants, right, in its multicultural context with all her contradictions and tensions. And this one's no exception. But this is that the first of your books you published in the West, as well as here. Do you think it's important for Southeast Asian writers to be published in the West to get that recognition? I think uh, Southeast Asian uh, uh, writers and the works they produce have grown, have a, 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 a contribution to world literature. I think we have a unique voice and a cultural diversity not found in, for example, uh, in many places. We are both uh, continent, you know, peninsula and, and islands. And we have such a diverse uh, 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 people. When, when I was in Bangkok receiving the uh, Southeast Asia Right Award and I listened to translation of stories written by Lao Xin and the Vietnamese writers and all that, you know, it opened my eyes to, to the kind of uh, people around us so that it makes me want to read these works in translation and look beyond literature coming out from uh, the UK and, and uh, the US. But I would also like to share our uh, work and our culture, our point of view with uh, people like you, you know, and, and, and Shell, you know, in London and in New York. Well, I'm very glad you have. Uh, um, yes, she, she's my writing pal as well, you know, <laughs> but it's... Um, right, I've got one more question, then perhaps we could uh, open it up to two or three from the floor. Hey, one of the great pleasures of reading the book is also the rich picture you paint of Singapore's recent past, right? It depicts, well, for me, it seems like a lost world of tea houses, people singers, coffin shops, death houses, night soil collectors, hawkers, urchin boys swimming in the rivers, creeks, all that. And you depict it in a way that seems rather like the way Ping describes people music, lyrical and sometimes violent and cruel. Isn't the same what you feel nostalgic for? Mm, sometimes, sometimes, you know, but um, you see, that's, that's, that's the Western reader, prime example, you know, <laughs> I bet the rest of you from 
Singapore, when you read it, you won't be thinking, oh, lovely tea houses and all that, and, and uh, jump buns and so on. <laughs> you won't be looking at all those things. You'll be looking at something else. Because I think that the other part of it would be that it also, the novel is also yeah, set in University of Iowa in the Midwest, University of California, and, and so on. You know. And, and it's, it is something that uh, many of us feel that we have one foot here and one foot there and we are able to, to be at home in the West and here. And I think in, in the novel, Pink, the heroine, discovers that eventually, although when she left at 17, she vowed, I would never return, I hate Singapore. So she finds her identity coming back to the other Well, I am not going to review that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Okay. Shall we take a couple of questions, then, if there are any? I'm bringing the question. <laughs> 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 I would hope any that I'll ask one question. Uh, <laughs> uh, the not writing. typical, Francis. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit about the writing process, because you said that this idea was when you saw this old man and then, so how did the process continue, you know? This, by the way, I noticed this, the last novel you wrote was a long, long time ago, so there's been a long gap, I noticed. So, what was the process, you know, how did all these things kind of, how did the B part come in, and, and how did this process actually until, until the final? Okay. Right. Do you have a big idea first, and then you write it out, or do pieces come in after a while, and then you change it, and, and etc. How How is this process? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I I find it very difficult in a way to describe it in a logical manner. It's actually not logical. You you you're right when you say that the, my long piece of work, a bit of a right the novel that was published in uh, two thousand and one, I think. So that's in a, a long gap. But I haven't been lazy. Uh, in between, I've been doing. Uh, short stories, you know, and I published a non-fiction book on the South, Southeast Asian Chinese and also film scripts for the British Council and things like that. But while I was doing all these things, then these images, you know, just is like uh, kept bugging me. Let me let, let, let me tell you something. I just uh, two Three days ago, I was invited by the uh, book club called Ambassador's Wives Book Club. <laughs> These are all Ambassador's Wives, but among them were three writers. One writing crime, one novels like me, another one uh, writing short stories, but they were either in, in uh, German, two in German and one in Italian. So. Uh, but we were talking about, you know, this exactly the question you asked. How did you do it? So I said, I kept seeing these figures, you know, and they bugged me. For each novel, each novel I would have these figures. But I, when it starts, I do not see their faces at all. It would be like in Fistful of Colors, I saw the back of this woman with long hair, painting a wall with her bare hands. And that scene became the first, the opening chapter of this book. All right. Uh, so I was talking about the silent figures. You see, like this, this uh, evicted farmer that I kept seeing. He never spoke to me in all the years, you know, because one, he saw me as, you know, Amor, belonging to the Western educator. He ignored me. Two, you know, he he spoke in a dialect and couldn't communicate. And he looked so sad, I didn't dare to intrude. Uh, uh, so they, they were all silent. Then the Italian writer said, the way hers was, she said, oh, she's like a little devil, you know, just on my left shoulder. And I said, shut up. <laughs> so that's how she wrote, yeah, trying to quiet, you know, uh, uh, this voice at, at her. So for me, I had to interrogate the silent figures. 
and sometimes it's two years. You ask me how do I put all the the, the scenes or the you know unconnected images together. I think there's something magical if you sit every day, you know, it's quite a stupid thing to do, but that is obsession. Or maybe that's passion. Passion, I told somebody, is obsession with a touch of madness. So every day, you know, at nine o'clock, you sit in front of the desk, staring at a blank screen and go. At the end of it, you know, uh, you collect all these words, 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 words for six months or so, maybe later on, you throw them all away. Yeah, yes, and then you start again, you know, and eventually you come up with something. <coughs> but, yeah, I think it is faith, it is faith. It's a journey in faith, in the process, in, in the magic of writing, in the magic of play. I mean, I'm sure Samuel with his music, you know, it, I remember reading impression of a pipa player, his book, describing how he learned the pipa. That also inspired me and gave me more information. Until his fingers bled. But that must be mad. You're a kid, you want to learn an instrument, not like a guitar that makes you popular. You're learning an instrument that makes your fingers bleed. See? If you ask why, it's like, why do I love this woman? You don't know. Is it because of her hair? Because she's kind? No, she could be cruel and you still love her. She could be fat and you still love her. And he snores and she still loves him. <laughs> There's something magical in relationship, whether it is with a real figure or the figure inside your head. Name the stranger in our head. You know, that stranger who comes. That's for me. For other people, it might be different. Um, and my article is in the West. Um, so, Jenna, I just wanted to ask something. You know, it's, it's interesting that this is published both in the West and here. Um, you also talked about earlier about how, in a sense, different writers, they, um, different readers rather will respond to it differently. So, who do you write for? You! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true because he was one of my early readers, Jeff. And to tell you the truth, I thought that this river song. When I wrote about the the the, pair, the, the lovers, Wayne and Ping, as children, I thought it would become a children's story, you know, for 10 or 11 years old. And I still remember Clarinda, I don't know whether she's here, who said, please, please write us a, a story for set one, you know, and I thought that was it. But then it grew and grew and became something else. And I couldn't control. Actually, I was, I remember I was telling you, Wayne, how he troubled me and I didn't want him to be such a big character but in the end, he decided to go to prison and he decided to talk, yeah? Yeah, so it's not my fault. Have you been asked to talk in Chami? No. <laughs> not at all, not at all. So it shows that, you know, when we keep on thinking about boundaries, we might be imprisoning ourselves. We just write and have faith and just write. Something good will come up. Fear is our greatest enemy. Fear is the greatest enemy of all writers. We must have hope. Even if the publish, publisher after publisher after publisher rejects us, we still believe that what we are doing Good. Okay. Yeah, I will be in Changi and talking here in Yaha's house. Parliament. <laughs> I used to be Parliament House. But I read in, in, in the Parliament Chamber before. <coughs> How did you choose your publisher? How did I choose my publisher? <laughs> well, actually, uh, well, I don't have to go through the whole long publishing history, right? But i just tell you this one, uh, Cheryl. Uh, um, I, I, I decided that maybe I'm 65, I have nothing to lose. 
I've never had a literary agent. And then there is uh, Jay, um, Jay Priya actually, from Jack Coranda Agency, has been, you know, kind of persuading me to, to, to uh, uh, have a literary agent. So I decided to sign up with her then and thought, well, you know, this might be my last book, or I might die next year or tomorrow. What do I have to do? Just try. So I gave it to, to Jay, and then she, of course, you know, uh, shopped around. And uh, she told me about various uh, publishers and so on. But the one thing that changed for me was she said, the publisher of Aurora Metro uh, cried when she read my book. <laughs> so uh, that decided for me. <laughs> I thought if, if somebody is moved by my book, then I should publish with her. So that, that's it. I didn't even do a background check on her. Or anything. I just said, uh, that's it. Publishers, they take note.
Does that answer your question? Yeah. I, I, I think in terms of the writing process and writing, um, the best teacher is actually ourselves and the practice. If every day we write, it's like playing the piano. I think writing as an art form is like music as an art form. We have to play our instrument three or four hours or six hours or ten hours every day for that half hour on stage. No? Yeah. Oh. So, I, uh, to what extent did the art form of the Pipa help so, to shape? To what extent did the art form of music Pipa, in this case, help to shape the form and structure of your novel? You know, I'm not a, a critic. You know, I'm not academic enough. And I just wrote it. So I, I can't answer that question, actually. Maybe those of you who teach books as literature, teach literature, can analyze it and see whether I have used that Right <laughs> now, I don't know. I'm just so relieved that the baby is born. No, my child. <laughs> Honestly, I, I can't answer that question. Yes. Uh, but that's a very good question for literature uh, teachers to ask. Should you ever pick this up as an A level text? <laughs> interesting questions. Um, we'd just like to thank a few other people. Um, I'd like to thank the British Council Writing the City Programme for sponsoring the event tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank Melissa, Sandra and Suchen for taking part, Aaliyah at the Arts House for use of the venue, and Helen Mangum, Suchen's agent, for being absolutely <coughs> marvellous and helping in a myriad of ways to make this a successful event. Um, we'd also like to invite you to attend some events we have coming up as part of the Singapore Writers Festival. On November the 7th, from 7 to 8 p.m., Su Chen will be signing books at the Festival Pavilion. And on November the 8th, Su Chen and I will be talking about the journey of the River Song from page to publication. That's from 9.30 to 10.30 in the Salon as part of the Writers Festival. So finally this evening I'd like to invite you to stay and have a glass of wine or a cold drink and maybe if you don't already have a coffee